Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Tim Simpson. I'm the pastor here. We're so excited to have Alan and Chelsea back with us uh, from the 49th and 50th states. Uh, I think it was funny that one was in Hawaii and one was in Alaska. And so, uh, so good to be back. Um, hey, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 6. Hey, can we bring up the... Can y'all see out there? I can't see you. Are we getting there? Are we on number six back there? Uh, we're coming. Hey, bright as the sun. I see you now. Okay, I got eyeballs. I see you on the back row even. Um, hey, uh, Genesis chapter six. We are in the middle of a series. If this is your first time with us, Genesis six uh, is in the middle of it. Genesis one through 11 is where we're aiming to, to be. Uh, so we'll end sometime in the fall, so you just hang on. Uh, you'll know when we get to the end, we'll finish chapter 11, and so you'll know. And so uh, Genesis chapter 6, uh, we're going to read from verse 9 all the way through chapter 7, and so and then there's going to be some more verses in chapter 8, and so I'm just going to go ahead and start. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with, make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come in to you to keep them alive. Also, take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals you, that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens, also male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights. And every living thing that I have made, I will blot out from the face of the ground. And now, and Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Noah was, Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood of clean animals and of animals that are not clean, and of birds, and of everything that creeps on the ground, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah, as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. On the very day Noah and his sons, Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark, they and every beast according to its kind, and all the livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, 
in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The flood continued forty days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the mountains, high mountains, under the whole earth, whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them fifteen cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry land, in whose nostrils was the breath of life, died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. Male and females, male and animals, man and animals, and creeping things, and birds of the heavens, they were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark, and the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. What a sobering text. The longer we read, the more the devastation becomes clearer and clearer. The big idea today I would like to present to you uh, is from Genesis 6, verse 9 through 8, chapter 20. I mean, 8, chapter 8, verse 20. Is this, by God's mercy and grace, God led them to build and enter the ark so that they would know salvation is only found in him alone. By God's grace and mercy, God led them to build and enter the ark so that they would know salvation is only found in him alone. God is the only place we can go for redemption. So today we're going to see this, uh, that Noah is quite the character in the Bible. Peter mentions him, Jesus mentions him, the book of Hebrews mentions him. He's mentioned all throughout Scripture. And so today we're going to study this a little bit more. I'll just tell you, I read some commentaries on these passages. Uh, they're quite familiar, right? Some of you who grew up in the church, you kind of hear the story of Noah, Noah, Noah. He built a arky, arky, okay? Some of you who grew up outside the church, you're like, what are you singing, Okay. But that's how we used to sing as a child, and it kind of sounded real fun that Noah built this big boat and all these animals went inside. But I'll tell you, it's no children's bedtime story. And so we hear this, and I just want you to know, I, I went way back. Uh, my pastor in Texas, his name is Tommy Nelson, and he discipled me, and he taught through this passage. And so I listened to his sermon also upon reading some commentaries, and I'm just trying to put it all together so that it becomes something that would resonate in our hearts. And so today, um, almost every commentator I read said that there was kind of acts and scenes. They go, act one, scene two, and, and they kind of go through that. So I'm going to give you seven acts today as we make our way through this passage so it's not so overwhelming to us. Because as, as we read it, there's a lot going on, okay? So the first one is this. They built the ark, the building of the ark, Genesis 6, 14 through 16. What, what, what is he told to build? Well, he's told to build an ark out of gopher wood. Some would say this is cypress wood. He's told to be, build rooms like nest for everybody, every animal. Build it with pitch so that it would be airtight. Some people would say this, this structure was 1,400 tons, 150 yards long, Okay. Everyone in this room knows what a football field looks like, okay? So this is longer than a football field. Even counting the end zones, extend that a little bit more. Everybody's got it, okay? Some of you guys walked in today. Let me just kind of lighten the mood just for a second. You saw the orange up here, and you're like, oh, those are bad colors. Some of you are like, this helps me worship God better. And so I'm just going to tell you, everybody knows what a football field looks like, okay? So this is a huge boat. Some of you guys have been to Kentucky and seen this life-size structure that they built, and it, it strengthened your faith. I have not been there, so some of you probably have more knowledge of what the inside of this boat looks like than even us today just reading the text. And so today, when we look at it, don't be overwhelmed, but it's huge. It's 25 yards wide. It's the size of 522 railroad cars would fit inside. 
Okay, you know the railroad cars that go by that's just stopping you at the, at the worst time. 522 of those would fit inside. Some would say there were 17,000 species, two of each. You know, they went two by two in there. And they said that in, those, uh, in the depth of the ark, in, the, in the, the volume of the ark, that 188 railroad cars would be filled with animals. So what you're looking at is a huge structure that has plenty of room to roam, even if you're a human, okay? There's only eight people on the boat, and everybody's walking around, but there's a lot of room on this boat. Some would call this like a super zoo, okay? It's a floating super zoo, and so it's uh, something we will never see again. So Noah started building this ark when he was 500 years old. Uh, I don't know what you picture when you're 500 years old, but I pictured Noah carrying wood on his shoulder. And this guy, I mean, he's, he's got to be pretty strong, right? He's building this boat for 100 years. And a lot of people say that there was a window that went all around for ventilation. Because I don't know about you, some of you get real happy when you smell the smells of barns and stuff like that. Hey, I'm a city boy. I want some ventilation. And so I can imagine you get all these species of animals on there and you got some serious fertilizer, right? That's a safe way to say that. So uh, the, the beautiful part is there is one door on the ark and God shuts that one door. Why does God do it? Because you couldn't have done it. Noah couldn't have done it. I couldn't have done it. Even the most non-compassionate person couldn't have shut that door. So God shuts it for him. And that's the proof over and over in Scripture that there is one way to salvation. There's one door on the ark. There's not multiple doors. There are not multiple paths up to the top of the mountain. There is one door on the ark John 10, 7 through 10 says it like this. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is making it very clear that he is the only way to salvation. So this is going to be our text over and over. We're going to come back to this main point that Jesus is the only way. So number two, act two is to gather. Genesis 6, 18 through 20. They're going to gather. Verse 18, but I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. So they're going to gather the people, the animals, the things. This is the first time we see this word covenant in the Bible. It's going to become a very important theological word for the rest of scriptures. You're going to see it. If you've read through the Bible multiple times, there's many different covenants. Okay, so this is the first time we see it is the Noahic covenant. You're going to see it in a few chapters in Genesis. You're going to see the Abrahamic covenant. Then you're going to see the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the old covenant, the new covenant. So this word covenant is very important. What is a covenant? A covenant is is something between God and people that God initiates and God holds it together. Because we all know that we can't hold the covenant together. One, because we're not from everlasting to everlasting. So God authors this covenant. We will see more about the Noahic covenant in Genesis chapter 9 next week. He's going to promise that he will never destroy the earth by flooding the earth again. We're going to look at this next week, so we're not going to get into it too much here. But I did want to say this. The initiative and burden of the covenant are with the Lord. In other words, Noah's part is building the ark and getting on it with his family, his wife, his three sons, and their their wives. Eight people in all. That's his part. He builds the big ark, and he gets on it, and God does the rest. So God is our Savior, and His covenant and word can be trusted. That's what we pull away from learning about the covenant. Verse 20. 
of the birds according to their kinds and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come into you to keep them alive. So this, this translation, your translation may say is something a little bit different, but come in to you. God sends them to the ark to migrate and hibernate. I know some of you would like to picture Noah out there with a lasso <laughs> capturing all these animals, all right? Hey, 17,000 species. I don't know what you thought Noah was doing while he was building the ark, but he's not out there lassoing animals, in my opinion. I believe God drives all these two by two to the ark, and they file in in an orderly fashion. Why do I believe this? Because God made them. And you might have a different theory and I'd love to hear it over a glass of sweet tea and whatever you want to drink. But I'm telling you, this is how I think it happened. That they came to Noah as he was, as the ark was finished, they're filing in. And once again, Noah's eyes are just like, God, you're, you're the only true God. They came to the right place. They could have gone to the highest mountain. They could have gone to the lowest valley. They could have burrowed into the ground. But none of those places would have saved them because the waters covered all of them. Even the highest peaks. It says 15 cubits deep. That's deep enough to drown even the strongest of animals. And so there is nowhere that they can find salvation except inside the ark. So let me just kind of put it this way. It's not enough to fear judgment. There are a lot of people on our planet, and you'll see them sometimes in big cities waving signs, and they're like, the judgment of God is coming. It is not enough just to fear the judgment of God. You have to realize where you can find salvation. So let me put it like this, because 2 Peter 2.5 says it. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. There were a lot of people who lost their lives because they may have feared judgment and may have had a sense that something was going on because Noah was building the ark, but they didn't fear it enough to put their salvation into the one true God. So Noah, of course, had compassion for the lost, just as you and I would have. And that's why, once again, God shuts the door. Look at verse, I'm at uh, scene 3, act 3, however you want to put it. Genesis 7, 1 through 5, 13 through 16. Then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens, also male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. On the very same day, verse 13, on the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Noah's wives and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark, they and every beast according to its kind, and all the livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life, and those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Hey, uh, can we just take a quick break? Are you guys hot? Okay, can somebody, uh, Russ or Todd, either one, if y'all would get on that air conditioning, just, just check it, all right? Because I am like up here, and I feel like I'm entering the ark with all these animals, okay? <laughs> we got a lot more people in here than uh, early service, and so I just, I, sometimes people get cold, and they're like, cut the air. I'm like, cut the air. Let's breathe, okay? Whew, I was glad. I was getting worried about myself. I was like, wow, <laughs> these, these animals are getting a little too close up here. Okay. So, uh, hey, they were organized. Uh, there were three decks. I, I picture this for food, for people, and for animals. I, I don't know how it breaks down. You've been, if you've been to the Ark in, in Kentucky, you may have had, seen a better breakdown. I, I don't know. 
We're just kind of guessing at, at how this would be organized. But the New Testament is more interested in why it was built and not how it was built or what he built. Okay? Hebrews 11.7. I almost made this as the big idea because God wrote it better than I could have written a big idea any day. It says, By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Let's unpack this just really quickly. By faith, Noah puts his faith in God. Okay, he's, he's saying, God, you're the one true God. And God warns him that things are about to happen. The flood is about to come. And so he is building this large structure, this ship for 100 years in reverent fear. He constructed an ark for the saving of his household. God had said, hey, no, I want you and your family. So there's eight people coming on to this boat. And by this, though, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. You see, God warned Noah of events that had not yet happened. Noah, by faith, trusted God. This is what uh, Jesus says in Matthew 24. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Can you imagine what the people thought of Noah and the ark? Some of them were gathered at parties. Maybe they were looking out their windows of their homes. Maybe they were on top of the homes as, as they gathered at that time. And they were looking at this man building this large boat. And I'm sure at many of those parties, while they were eating and drinking and marrying and life was going on, there was a lot of ridicule coming Noah's way. And I'm sure when Ham and Shem and Japheth we're getting that wood that people were like, what are you doing? Come, hey, come, come, come party with us. And so there's, there's all this ridicule that must have been happening. They probably talked about crazy old Noah, right? If you grew up in a small town or even a big town, there's something on the end of that that you, you just naturally come crazy old somebody, right? So in that day, they're talking about this man who's building this very large ship. Noah revered the word of God, though. He trusted in God's plan, even though he didn't know the future. So, so let me just kind of speak to you real quick, okay? Not real quick. This is going to last for a while, okay? <laughs> this is a shorter sermon, so, so take heed. Um, how many of you, don't, don't, don't raise your hand, don't, don't nod your head if you don't want to. Uh, how many of you believe that Jesus is coming again? Don't, you don't have to raise your hand. This is not that kind of place, right? How many of you truly believe in your heart that Jesus is coming again? How many of you would, you, would say, hey, I 100% affirm that in my heart of hearts? Well, well here's, what, here's what Noah Noah said, I believe in the flood and I am building the ark. I believe the flood is coming. I am building the ark. So here's what I, I would say to you guys today. Brothers and sisters, friends who are gathered here, people who don't know Jesus, this is what I would say to you today, that your life should stand out just like that ark. That people all around you should notice a difference in your life like that ark. And it may not be as big and bold as that ship that was bigger than a football field. But what I'm saying to you, if no one has ever said to you, there is something different about the way that you treat your spouse. And I, I can't get it. I, maybe you raise your kids in a different way. You spend your money in a different way. You, you do this in a different way. Every Sunday, you, you leave and you go somewhere and you come back and you look like you're happy. If no one has ever noticed a difference in you, what I would say to you as a, as a friend would be, I want you to get alone with God and go, God, have you ever saved me? Has there ever been a point where I said, Jesus, I submit to you as the king of my life, as the savior of my life? 
And hear me clearly. Your witness will grow in time. Some of you will be a witness like the size of the ark. Some of you will be like a little rowboat. Some of us will be somewhere in between. But there should be something about your life that stands out like the ark. And people all around you should notice a difference. Howard Hendricks, he was a professor at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. He was speaking to a bunch of successful uh, young men and women uh, a few years ago. And he said this, I'm not afraid that you guys are going to fail. I'm afraid that you are going to succeed at the wrong things. You're going to climb that ladder and get to the top and find it leaning against the wrong wall. Some of you are climbing a ladder that you think is leaning up against a wall. And when you get to the top, you're going to find that you have succeeded at the wrong things, my friend. And I am begging you. To look at the Bible and see the difference in the way that you are living your life and the way that the Bible says to live your life. And don't look at the obscure parts that you're like, I don't understand, I don't understand. I'm talking, look at the parts that are so easy to understand and go, Jesus, am I submitting to these? Read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, and go, Jesus, is my heart submitting to these? Because you don't want to get to the end of life. And find that you have climbed the wrong ladder. Leading to a place that doesn't redeem. The fourth act is judgment. Genesis 7. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the seventh day of the month, on the day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of the heavens were opened and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights and all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth and all mankind. Everything on the dry land and whose nostrils was the breath of life died he blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the earth face of the ground man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens they were blotted out from the earth only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark and the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days it was the judgment of God for all the sin all the violence All the saying and shaking their fist at God and saying, you're not the one true God. So act five. All Noah and the seven seven other people on the ark had to do was just wait. The Lord continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth and the ark floated on the face of the waters and the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the, f- the mountains covering them 15 cubits deep. As far as we can tell, there was no sail or rudder on the ark. All Noah could do was watch it float and wait and wait and wait. So Genesis 8, but God remembered Noah. It wasn't that God had forgotten Noah. Don't take that, okay? Wrap it around your human brain. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained. Who restrains the rain? God does. And the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month and on the seventh day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Where are the mountains of Ararat? Well, we would, we would, our best guess would be eastern Turkey, southern Russia, northwestern Iran. Some of you have Googled things and found documents that you're like, the, the, the Turkish people have the ark. Okay. 
I, I don't know. I don't know where the ark ended up, and I don't know where the ark is now, but what I do know is that God could take the ark where, where he wants it to go. So how does this apply to us? What is this? You're like, I'm not building a big boat. I, hey, I, I don't even know about sails and rudders. I, okay, okay. Some of us have bought into the fact that we can have a cross with a sail or a rudder. What do you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is that you believe that you can surrender to Jesus and still turn over your day timer to him, your, your, your planner to him, your schedule to him and go, Jesus, I do surrender to you, but these things need to happen. So you've got this cross in your mind with this rudder or this sail, and you're like, hey, I, hey that's, that's the way things need to happen, Jesus. If they don't happen that way, then I am not following you. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. When Jesus tells us to take up our cross daily and follow him, he is not asking who is sovereign. He is telling you that he is the king of kings and he is not working on your schedule. You are not the one in charge. So if you've been sold a version of Christianity where you think that's okay, I'm telling you the Bible stacks up over and over against you to say, no, God is the only one who is sovereign. And so Jesus says it like this in Luke 9. 23 through 24, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So can I just speak real honest to you parents out there? We're kind of that helicopter generation. Some of you are even hovering closer than that, maybe like a lawnmower speed on, on your kids. They can feel the, the blades all, o, all around them. Some of you believe in this version where you become a Christian and then your kids become a Christian and then they just buy into this American dream and they live right down the road from you and then everything is good. Probably getting a little too close to home, but I'm already over the edge, so here we go, okay? What I'm telling you is that I would love Cross Point to be a place where we say, yes, come to Jesus. Let your children come to know Jesus. And then maybe one day God calls them to the nations and instead of weeping tears of sorrow, you weep tears of joy because they have responded to a call that is bigger than you and I. So let me just go ahead and warn you as I just completed my first year of being your pastor. If you don't like that version of Christianity I'm asking you to stick around a little longer until God softens your heart because it is the version of Christianity that goes along with the Bible. And you can find a church that preaches a more comfortable gospel, but what you might find in that same church is that that's no gospel at all. So if you want to talk about that over a glass of tea, I'd be glad to. We can have muffins. We can have something dainty. Okay? I don't even know what that means. So, <clears throat> thank you for the air condition, though. I am feeling more alive than ever. Okay. Oh, thank God for air condition, okay? Uh, but go to the nations. I'm telling you where the air condition doesn't, it doesn't happen on Sundays. So, okay, this is a mixed message. Okay. Act 6, scene 6. <laughs> Genesis 8, 6 through 12, the ark rested. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. 
He waited another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark, and the dove came out to him, came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him anymore. So when I was listening to Tommy preach this text, uh, he, he talked about these two birds, and so I'm going to kind of, uh, I'm going to kind of share with you what he shared with me. Let's talk about these two birds, a raven and a dove. You can't get more opposite. Some of you did not have ravens released at your wedding, right? One of my buddies had doves released at his wedding, and I was like, what is going on? If that was your wedding, God bless you, okay? I just was like, whoa, man, you're stepping it up. Pinterest wasn't even around. Imagine what Pinterest would have done. I mean, they would have formed like some kind of so-and-so love so-and-so. Anyways, so glad I got married before Pinterest. And so moving on back to the raven, a raven is a scavenger bird, okay? It, it feeds on death. It looks for death. All the, the armadillos you see <laughs> ran over in the road, the ravens are coming down. You don't see the dove swooping down, okay? So the ravens, they're lighting on death. They're looking for roadkill. The raven is a stronger bird that can fly uh, much, much further. Let's just be honest about that. But the raven doesn't come back because the raven can land on rotting dead flesh and, and it's okay. But the dove did not find a place to set her foot just don't read too much into this, but I, I love how it switches right here. And it says, she, she returned. You know, the church is always called Jesus' bride. It's kind of talked about in that, that feminine way, she. And so this, this bird comes back because she didn't find a place to rest. She doesn't rest on death. The, the, the dove returned to Noah. The dove only finds rest in the hand of the Redeemer. So I thought that was beautiful in there that he says, so he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. So this may be an overstep, but I'm just going to tell you that, that true Christians don't find rest on death. I'm not saying you don't enjoy sin because let's just be honest, we all enjoy sin, everyone in this room. But ravens, uh, they enjoy death. Non-Christians enjoy sin. Just like I said, Christians enjoy sin, but there is a difference in the way that this happens. Doves enjoy life. The dove was looking for the new world, the resurrected world. The dove was looking for life. And so what I'm saying to you, brothers and sisters today, is you and I should enjoy life. And if you find something pulling you towards death, pulling you towards your grave clothes. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you because you are a child of God as a Christian. And so there should be a tug in your heart that says that leads to death. So I, I worked with college students 17 years and I would talk to college guys and I would say, what do you struggle with? And they'd be like, I struggle with everything. And I would be like, no, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. We, we struggle with all kinds of sin. But I'm saying to you, brother, across the table from me, what do you struggle with? These college guys, you could just see it just kind of reeling in their heads because they're sitting across from their college pastor. And maybe they were thinking, I don't want to tell you what I struggle with. And so while they were thinking, I would usually tell them, what I struggle with. If I had a go-to sin to rest on, to go back to, that's what I would flee to. And you can see these college guys going, well, man, he just told me. So eventually they would kind of let it roll out. And I would say to them, the best place you could bring your sin is into the light so that you and I could, could, could beat it to, de to death together. Let's get a little graphic, right? Because sin, sin wants to kill you. John Owen would say, be killing sin or it'd be killing you. So I would say to them, thank you for bringing your sin into the light so we can deal with it. So be encouraged. 
If you feel yourself drifting towards those deadly sins that bring you respite, and you feel the Holy Spirit bringing your heart back to where you should rest, and the only place for true rest is in the Redeemer's hand. So number seven, the Great Commission. This is Acts 7. It looks a little different than what we're going to say in a few minutes out loud together. And so Genesis 8, 13 through 20, in the 600 and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 20th and the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Then God said to Noah, Go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, everything that comes on the earth went out by families from the ark. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So Noah comes out of the boat with all these, uh, with his family and all these animals. And his first act after emerging from this ark is to worship God. Noah builds an altar and he sacrifices to the one true God who saved him and his family from utter destruction. God wasn't looking for a perfect man. He chose Noah by his grace. Noah responded in faith. Noah left the ark. He took some of every clean animal and bird and he sacrificed them to God and they were a blood offering to his Savior. And that was his first act when he got off this boat. So you and I should have this sense of gratefulness that maybe this was not our experience. We didn't go on a big boat for 150 days with every species of animal and bird and creeping thing. Doesn't that word just kind of creep you out, right? (laughs) But you and I have been saved, and so therefore we should be grateful. When I was thinking about this uh, text, um, this song came to me, uh, it's All I Have is Christ. Shelly and I were at this conference a few years ago, and we were in this room with um, lots of men and women, and we were singing, and this song came on. And at first, when it started playing, I was like, this, this is kind of like really straightforward. So I, I'm going to read some of the lyrics to you. Some of them I printed on. One, one uh, verse I printed for you on the back of your sheet your teaching sheet, I believe. I hope you got one today. I should have said that somewhere earlier in the service. Okay? All I have is Christ. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way. The sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first... I would refuse you still. But as I ran my hellbound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love displayed. You suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. Now all I know is grace. Now, Lord, I would be yours alone and live so all might see the strength to follow your commands could never come from me. O Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose and let my song forever be my only boast is you. So when you and I are reflecting on Noah and the ark And his family, you just go back to verse 2. There was nothing about Noah that that was great. There was a point in Noah's life where he was running that hellbound race along with everyone else who's ever been created, that we were all created as enemies of God. And he was indifferent to the cost. He had no concept that God was going to use him 
to build a massive ark to save his family while everyone else on the planet perished. But at some point, God loved him first and pursued him and saved him and gave him the faith and the grace that he needed to repent and believe that he is the one true God. And it says it very clearly, you looked upon my helpless state, because Noah, he was helpless. Some people have this weird conception that you and I are dog paddling in the water and God comes and saves us because we've done our part. Let me just give you a biblical version of yourself. You are on the bottom of the deepest ocean and you are dead, dead, dead. That's what it means to be helpless. And God gave you Life. God gave you the faith and the grace that you needed, and He led you to the cross. And it says, And I beheld God's love displayed. You suffered in my place, Jesus. You bore the wrath, the reserve for me, Jesus. And now all I know is grace. So, friend, brother, sister, when you think about the cross, I want you to have this huge view of a sovereign God who from Genesis to Revelation is saying the same thing over and over is that he is the one true God and salvation can only be found in him and there is one door on the ark and there is one cross. And Jesus laid his life down for you. As my friend used to say, he willingly gave his hands to the nails. And that kind of grace and that kind of mercy can only be found in Jesus. You can search through all the other religions and all the other ways, and you will find no one that says, it's by grace you have been saved. So that separates us. From all those other people climbing the mountains, from all those people with their ladders leaned up against the wrong walls, that is what separates Christianity, is that you and I could have never deserved His grace. That's why it's called grace. So be encouraged, brothers and sisters. And I pray this week that your life would be like that ark. I pray that sooner or later, one of your neighbors will come over to you and go, something inside of you is making you tick that I don't quite get, and you're a little weird, but I want to know what that is. Can I tell you a quick story? Okay. I didn't tell this at the early service. It's really quick. I was talking to my buddy. He lives in uh, Arkansas. There's Christians in Arkansas. And so... um, um, he said he has a neighbor, and uh, he said this neighbor, he said, he said about every couple of weekends, he just comes over on my back porch, and he said my neighbor just drinks himself into oblivion. My buddy is a, is a pastor at a church over there, and he just said, but I think the message of the gospel is getting through to him. I think it's slowly seeping in is that there is redemption found in Jesus. And I was like, what a, what a strange evangelism story, okay? But he said he, he, he and his family came with my family to church on Easter. And he said, I'm, I'm just slowly letting the gospel do its work in his heart so that eventually he will see That salvation is not found in where he's been placing it. And that salvation is in Jesus alone. And Jesus alone can come and help you with those sins that lead to death. 
So, hey, hey, if you're here today and you're like, man, you, you're a little too aggressive with the gospel. Uh, first of all, I would say thank you. And then second of all, I, I'd love to have a conversation with you. Our elders would love to talk to you. Your Sunday school teacher would love to talk to you. I would love to know what is going on in your heart and in your head. And I would love for you to get to know me. So that's my offer to you. As we close this service, I'm always around. Just find me after the service. Will you pray with me? Father God, we just... uh, We marvel at your grace and your mercy. We marvel at the fact that you have placed us where you have placed us in Sumter and these surrounding areas. That you have given us the house, apartment, the condo, the place that we live. And you have placed a a sphere of influence around us so that we could be a light to those people. And so today I pray, God, that each of us would live lives that would be as bold as the ark. And that people would be drawn to you, Jesus, not drawn to us. We really don't have a lot to offer them. The best thing we could give to them is the life-giving gospel that saved us when we were certainly on our hell-bound race. Father, I pray that we would be a part of reclaiming the glory of God here in Sumter and in South Carolina and to the nations. Father, I pray that the nations would be glad through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.